Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the globe you happen to be. Welcome to session 11 of the Second World Sepsis Congress. The topic for this session is the prevention of infection and sepsis. Uh, I am Nathan Nielsen from New Orleans, Louisiana, the United States. Uh, I am not Dr. Janet Diaz, who is on the initial program. Dr. Diaz is presently assisting with the Ebola outbreak in Congo, so uh, Godspeed and all the best to her and her colleagues. Without uh, further ado, uh, let me welcome the over 15,000 participants from around the world to this session, uh, representing over 150 countries. Particular thanks go out to the exclusive sponsor of this session, uh, Pfizer. We appreciate their support in all of our World Sepsis Congress and World Sepsis Day efforts. We have a great lineup of speakers for us today. Uh, our first speaker, who will be discussing vaccination as a strategy to prevent invasive bacterial infections and sepsis, is Tamara Pilishvili. Apologies if I mispronounce. Uh, joining us from the Respiratory Diseases Branch of the U.S. Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Uh, she is an expert in bacterial respiratory diseases and vaccines for the prevention of bacterial infection, with a particular expertise in pneumococcus. This looks to be a uh, fascinating contribution to our discussion so far. So, Dr. Pilishvili, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to conference organizers for this opportunity to speak to you on the role of vaccinations uh, to prevent invasive bacterial infections. Um, according to 2013 WHO estimates, 52% uh, of all deaths in children under age 5 globally uh, result from infectious diseases, with pneumonia being the leading infectious cause of death. About 15% of deaths of children under 5 are attributed to pneumonia, with additional 7% uh, uh, due to sepsis. Uh, vaccines offer perhaps the best opportunity uh, for rapidly increasing uh, child survival. And I'm going to focus on two pathogens, Streptococcus pneumonia and Haemophilus influenza, as uh, these contribute to a large uh, burden of invasive bacterial infections and contributed to uh, significant morbidity and mortality worldwide, especially before the introduction of conjugate vaccines. Um, to Streptococcus pneumonia specifically, 14.5 uh, million episodes of severe pneumococcal disease uh, were attributed among children uh, less than five, with uh, five, over half a million deaths uh, occur occurring annually in children under five. And if we look at the if we look at the map of, of where these deaths occur, uh, most of the mortality, over half of the deaths occurred in Africa and countries with highest incidence of death due to pneumococcal infections uh, are in the developing uh, world. In terms of the burden of Haemophilus influenza type B disease, which is uh, the only vaccine preventable fraction of the Haemophilus influenza infect, uh, infections caused by Haemophilus influenza, um, 8.13 million episodes of severe hip disease occur in children under five, with uh, around 200,000 deaths annually in children under five. Five. And uh, these estimates are uh, from also from WHO around 2008. And if we look at the um, map also where the, uh, these deaths occur due to hip infections, um, it looks um, very similar to the map of uh, pneumococcal uh, attributed deaths where most of the deaths occur in uh, developing uh, countries. Well, luckily, uh, there are uh, vaccines available, very effective uh, vaccines for the prevention of uh, both pneumococcal and Hib infections. And for the sake of time, uh, I'm focusing on these two pathogens on, and on the two uh, vaccines to prevent um, infections caused by streptococcus pneumonia and hemophilus influenza type B. Um, conjugate, uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, uh, currently uh, there are two uh, formulations available on the market, the 10-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and 13-valent uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Uh, these vaccines are immunogenic in infants. They induce 
immunologic memory and uh, uh, the response can be boosted. Uh, the first formulation, the seven valent vaccine was available since 2000. And uh, most of the vaccines, uh, when measured, the, uh, the burden of disease that they were able to uh, cover when they were introduced, around 70 to 80 percent of invasive pneumococcal infections, uh, depending on the region, were covered by the available uh, vaccines. Uh, and now uh, the uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines are in, uh, used on uh, various schedules uh, with three or four dose uh, infant schedules. And some countries have also introduced uh, conjugate vaccines for use among adults. Uh, now, if you look at the map of uh, infant introdu introduction of the uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, um, the, one of the first countries introducing the, the uh, seven valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine was the U.S. And since then, um, through, through 2017, 142 countries introduced uh, uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines into their national immunization program. So um, a great uh, success um, uh, has occurred in terms of the introduction of uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccines in the world. Um, the uh, U.S., which is one of the earliest countries that has introduced the vaccine, the inf infections, uh, invasive pneumococcal infections have reduced dramatically since the introduction of the vaccine. For when the seven valent dose vaccine was introduced, the uh, rates of invasive pneumococcal disease were measured at around uh, 100 per 100,000 in children under five. And since then, uh, since the introduction of the seven valent vaccine in 2000, and then the 13 valent vaccine in 2010, uh, the um, infections have uh, reduced, invasive pneumococcal infections have reduced to uh, around uh, nine cases per 100,000. And infections that are caused by strains that are covered by the vaccine have virtually been eliminated in the US. And very similar picture has been observed in other countries that have introduced either seven or 10 valent vaccines. Uh, there are certain groups, uh, like uh, persons with underlying conditions um, or uh, in certain geographic areas, for example, in the US, American Indian, Alaska Native populations have experienced a, a disproportionately higher rates of uh, invasive pneumococcal disease. Um, and uh, uh, one of the examples is um, in a Navajo population, uh, American Indian Navajo populations, uh, uh, that where the rates of invasive pneumococcal infections were measured in children at around uh, 200 per 100,000, which is almost a double. Uh, more than a double, actually, than in, in the general U.S. population. However, after introduction of the conjugate vaccines, the, uh, the same success story has been demonstrated in these populations where the um, uh, infections caused by strains covered by the vaccine have virtually been eliminated. Um, in addition to benefits of reducing uh, invasive infections caused by pneumococcus, um, uh, one of the uh, additional benefits of the conjugate vaccine has been reduction in antibiotic-resistant infections. And the reason why is because strains that are covered by the vaccine have, uh, have been also uh, strains that are resistant uh, to one or more um, antibiotics. And so what the countries that have introduced the vaccine uh, have observed also is the reduction in um, uh, antibiotic non susceptible infections. In terms of HIV conjugate vaccine, um, it's, uh, HIV vaccines have been introduced uh, before uh, pneumococcal uh, uh, conjugate vaccines uh, in the world. There's only one vaccine against type B uh, disease that is available currently. There are six capsular serotypes for haemophilus influenza, but type B caused around 95% of all haemophilus influenza in disease infection, uh, infection caused by haemophilus influenza. There are various formulations um, of the vaccine from uh, monovalent to uh, part of the multivalent vaccines. This is a conjugate vaccine, uh, and just like a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, it provides herd immunity because it reduces uh, nasopharyngeal carriage and transmission, and therefore uh, benefits are observed even in unvaccinated populations. 
in. As I said, uh, hip vaccine was introduced into childhood immunization schedule uh, much earlier. In the U.S., it was in 80s. Um, uh, on um, infant schedule with either three primary uh, doses or three primary doses with a booster, depending on the formulation. Uh, if we look at the uh, a ma a map of introduction of the vaccines uh, a little earlier, the oncologic hip vaccines, but at the same time in the world, in the rest of the world, the uptake of the hip vaccine uh, has been uh, lower um, compared to the developed countries. Uh, but through 2015, 192 countries introduced HIV vaccines into the national immunization program. And the effectiveness of these vaccines uh, has been demonstrated, efficacy has been demonstrated through clinical trials, but then uh, the success stories came from um, all, all countries that have introduced uh, um, these vaccines into their national immunization program with the reductions observed in meningitis caused by HIV, in uh, invasive infections and mortality uh, attributed to uh, HIV. And um, they are uh, demonstrating very high effectiveness of this vaccine against um, infect HIV infection. Uh, in the U.S., uh, a more recent uh, story, because the vaccine has been introduced in the 80s, uh, infections due to hemophilus influenza type B has, have virtually been uh, el eliminated, and the rates of infections are uh, have uh, have been um, at all time low for the uh, past um, decade or more. Uh, however, infections due to non type B infections have uh, in increased. And most of this increase is attributed to non type of multimodal influenza or uh, mostly um, type A um, in terms of the type of hemophilus influenza and type A hemophilus influenza. And um, um, uh, there is actually a vaccine in the pipeline against uh, uh, type A hemophilus influenza disease. As I mentioned, in the U.S., uh, the vaccine, HIV vaccine was introduced much earlier, and that's where most of the benefits were observed, where uh, the rate of uh, incidence of uh, HIV meningitis decreased from around 25 per 100,000 to uh, less than 5 per 100,000 um, over a course of uh, less than a decade. And, and just to conclude, vaccine-preventable uh, invasive bacterial infections contribute to significant morbidity and mortality worldwide. Use of conjugate vaccines, uh, PCV uh, and HIV, have led to uh, reduce morbidity and mortality caused by these bacterial uh, infections that, that uh, contribute to um, uh, a lot of di uh, disease burden due to invasive bacterial infections. And Pneumococcal conjugate vaccines uh, reduce pneumococcal infections in children um, as well as adults through indirect herd effects because these vaccines uh, provide herd immunity and also reduce antibiotic resistant infections. And there are further benefits expect expected through higher valency uh, PCDs as well as non type B vaccines uh, that are in the pipeline. And I would like to conclude with that. Thank you very much. Fantastic talk, Dr. Pilch, really uh, quite, quite excellent in showing the, the worldwide effects of these vaccines, the potential to decrease infection, and morbidity, and suffering worldwide. Um, I have one question, and we have one from audience as well. Uh, my question, what do you see as the major barriers into improving vaccine uptake and access worldwide? So there's a co combination um, uh, of issues. I mean, the uh, uptake has been slow, mostly uh, due to the cost, uh, especially for conjugate uh, pneumococcal vaccines. The cost has been a big barrier for countries to introduce their into national immunization programs. But uh, through organizations, um, uh, uh, the donor organizations, and through Global Alliance for Vaccines uh, Initiative, uh, there has been uh, help provided, and uh, the programs in place to accelerate the introduction of these vaccines and uh, the um, uptake that we see in countries uh, is largely due to um, the, uh, a lot of work that has been put into accelerated introduction um, um, in countries. In addition, you know, demonstrating disease burden for countries and making a case for vaccine introduction 
uh, had been a barrier, and that's mostly due to poor laboratory practices where the disease burden is not established, uh, and so there's lack of awareness of the presence of infections and the uh, ability to measure the burden. Um, uh, and so the help in terms of establishing surveillance systems so that they can document the burden of disease as well as measure the impact of the vaccine introduction that has uh, helped countries make decisions. Excellent. Then uh, one quick technical question. Um, one of our guests has asked, how many doses of pneumococcal vaccine would be required to decrease the risk of sepsis among children? So the current recommendation, most of the uh, countries are using a three-dose schedule, and uh, that has been shown to be effective uh, in uh, well, both uh, reducing uh, in uh, disease in uh, preventing disease in vaccinated children, as well as reducing infections in uh, unvaccinated through herd effects. And um, there are countries that use. Uh, um, three plus zero, which is uh, three primary doses before the uh, age of one uh, without a booster. But uh, most of the developed countries are using uh, two primary doses with a booster in the second year of life, uh, which seems to do uh, better in terms of the, uh, reducing the carriage and transmission and therefore uh, potentially leading to better herd effects. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, we need to be moving on. Thank you very much, Dr. Pilis, really for a great beginning to our session. We appreciate your uh, insights and your willingness to give your time. Moving on, our next speaker is Dr. Pinaki Panigrahi. Apologies for if I mispronounce anything. Um, a very well-respected pediatric infectious disease physician, presently at the University of Nebraska in the United States. Uh, Dr. Panigrahi is a founding director of the Center for Global Health and Development at the University of Nebraska. He's an active and accomplished researcher in childhood infections and diseases worldwide with active projects in Southern Asia and Africa. Without further ado, uh, Dr. Panigrahi will be speaking to us on oral symbiotics to prevent sepsis infection in young infants. Dr. Panigrahi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's a wonderful feeling to be speaking to the entire world from the home, uh, comfort of our homes. And uh, I will be focusing on, on uh, neonatal infection, but uh, take it a little bit beyond the first month of life and, uh, and uh, symbiotics, uh, which, uh, which I will uh, explain in a, uh, in a minute. Uh, neonatal sepsis is, is a big is a big problem worldwide. Uh, the morbidity uh, as well as mortality is very high in several millions. And if you look at under five children, all infections that also is is very very high in terms like in six, over six million. So there is a need that we do something, and the current uh, leave whatever is being done, including antibiotics, is is not good enough. Um, we all know now uh, about probiotics. These are uh, uh, harmless uh, bacteria, but they have health promoting uh, impact on the host. Prebiotics are sugars that help uh, that are non that are not absorbed uh, in the uh, in the uh, um, small intestine go up to colon and help uh, the bacteria grow. Uh, the the health promoting bacteria and symbiotics as a combination of probiotics and, and prebiotics and I'll be talking about a symbiotic preparation that we used in a large clinical trial. Uh, before I do that, I will very quickly review the literature uh, uh, what what is available on uh, sepsis and uh, necrotizing enterocolitis uh, where probiotics have been used and then give you some preliminary data which we have uh, generated literally over the last couple of decades before we launched the large trial that was uh, published last year uh, in uh, in uh, Nature. Uh, when uh, the probiotic uh, field uh, has evolved in the last two, two and a half decades quite a bit, and uh, as you can see here, um, the first study appeared in late 90s where uh, um, giving probiotics reduced uh, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis in, in, in a nursery. And however, if you look at the rest of the studies, the half and half, half of them showed uh, a good impact and half of them had no impact. 
And uh, the same continued until uh, recently, where uh, some of these studies were very small, 40, 50, 100 baby studies. Uh, but even larger studies um, and uh, recent studies show that uh, some work and some do not work, uh, including uh, lactobacillus GG, which is a very popular and uh, well-studied uh, uh, probiotic. Recently, it was shown that it not only has no effect, but it may increase neck and uh, uh, sepsis. Uh, so when we uh, were um, working on necrotizing enterocolitis, and then you will have in a minute why I'm talking about this disease when my talk is on, uh, on sepsis, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis is a disease of premature babies, and uh, until until now, we think that uh, ischemia, bacteria, and substrate in the gut are the uh, incriminating <coughs> factors. Um, I don't know what, uh, and, uh, and no specific agent has uh, has been uh, identified uh, till date. It's a it's a really bad disease uh, in terms of mortality and morbidity. Uh, what we did uh, when we were looking at uh, the disease and trying to find out what uh, really if it has any infectious agent, for the first time we showed that there was a lack of um, presence of any infectious agent. Um, we looked at the cases and controls, and however we found that the uh, uh, occurrence of this disease could be dependent on the patterns of bacterial adherence uh, and the colonization. Uh, we showed those uh, that through um, in vitro uh, tissue culture and uh, rabbit uh, ileal loop model. And those are very simple uh, and also translocation of uh, uh, E. coli was uh, uh, shown to be important in the, in the disease uh, pathogenesis. And the experiments that we did those days were very uh, simple. You can see uh, in in panel A, uh, if you put gram negatives, uh, E. coli, they will adhere in large numbers. In panel B, you have gram positives. And these gram positives were enterococci uh, and staph group of organisms taken from healthy babies. They will also adhere. But if you combine them in panel C, you can see the adherence of the gram negatives are totally uh, blocked. Uh, although some gram positives continued uh, to stay uh, attached. And the same happened in the translocation model where uh, gram positives could stop translocation. And then we took it through uh, a rabbit, uh, winning rabbit uh, ileal loop model and um, and by instilling uh, normal flora E. coli into loops, we produced uh, disease. And when we combined the same E. coli along with some gram positives, uh, we could uh, protect disease. And that point, we and in these models, we uh, we we saw that normal flora E. coli could uh, could uh, produce disease, um, and translocation and attachment was was to our mind the key. And specific gram positive organisms, quite negative staph like staph staph epi and enterococci, could protect disease. And there was always always concomitant uh, sepsis. Uh, in this model, and in our patients, the same thing happens when we have a tech patient uh, there, they have sepsis. So we, um, and then we thought, can we can we really give uh, prevent this disease by giving enterococci or staph epi to our patients? And the answer was obviously not, because those are pathogens, and uh, quite a few of our patients get sepsis due to those pathogens. So we thought about probiotic. Can we give probiotic? Which one to use, and uh, how many, what time? And then when we went to the market, obviously it was flooded with all different kinds of probiotics and with very little or no scientific evidence as to why it should be chosen. And no wonder people called probiotics as uh, snake oil uh, at that uh, time. We didn't know whether it is going to colonize the neonatal gut. We didn't really know uh, how exactly it may work and it will in the pathogenesis. So we did some hospital, small hospital-based trials and as usual we took LGG to see if it will colonize and we and some other known known strains and they did not colonize at all in the neonatal gut. These are small 30, 40 type baby studies. So we thought art is being used from really a box of chocolates. We don't know what we are going to get or what. Uh, and uh, so we went ahead and uh, started screening strains over the 280 strains from all different sources. We started with the then went with uh, lactobacillus. 
uh, and several uh, Sandharam strands. And finally, uh, again, through these adherence and transformation model, I finally found that only two strains out of close to 300 worked in our models. One was a Pantarum and the other one was a, a Salivarius and uh, it did the job that we wanted it to do in the in the model. This is a normal ileal loop when you give uh, E. coli. These are non-pathogenic, not belonging to any of the pathogenic E. coli groups. Uh, they produce massive uh, damage when you uh, combine it with, uh, with the probiotics then there was uh, Complete uh, uh, restoration, and there was no blockage except some blunting uh, of the of the villi. Then we took it through uh, typical uh, talk studies through neonatal uh, rabbits to make sure that it is safe before we we gave it to infants. And uh, then we did two hospital-based trials. Uh, the first one is to see the safety and also to see if it colonizes. And in fact, in indeed the, the symbiotic where we added the prebiotic. Uh, helped and it colonized for up to four months. Then we did another study in about 280 babies and finally launched the big trial um, in the community where sepsis is the is the biggest uh, killer. And this study was designed uh, um, as a individually randomized uh, uh, trial, and uh, we wanted uh, we planned to enroll about 8,000 uh, babies. Uh, with 80% power to detect even a 20% relative rate uh, reduction, but in about half, after half, of, um, in the middle of the study, when we had enrolled 45, 4600 babies, the DSMB stopped it because there was uh, uh, evident uh, if, um, impact in one arm, and then it was unblinded, and we uh, there was uh, the effect was seen. This was done in the eastern part of India in Orissa, which is a poor. A research poor uh, state and has a lot of disease morbidity. We we chose two different districts in uh, two geographic uh, areas, and uh, and uh, several villages uh, were uh, taken under uh, for, for the trial, uh, and uh, um, and it was it was randomized in the blocks of uh, four. Uh, and uh, we gave uh, the preparation to newborn babies not on day one because they can have early onset sepsis and birth asphyxia and other problems, but in the first four days of life, day two, three, or, uh, or, or four, and then watch them at home for 60 days. Uh, and all the um, adverse events and serious adverse events were uh, were monitored in in the hospital, uh, and we had to establish labs and uh, uh, NICUs in in that part of the world that time. Uh, and this was a study design. You can see at the bottom, every village has one woman and then some supervisors, and finally uh, two attached hospitals uh, that were tracking uh, and then caring for the babies. And uh, we screened uh, over 7,000 infants, of which 2,500 were uh, were excluded for one uh, different reasons, and about 2,200 uh, uh, enrolled uh, in in each group. Uh, you can see the exclusion for criteria. There were some that were already by the time we reached the homes, they were more than four days old, and uh, some were uh, preterm uh, and or uh, low birth weight. Uh, which we also excluded, uh, and then there were quite a few, 200 uh, that had birth asphyxia and um, or some maternal uh, infectious uh, uh, problems, uh, and uh, 245 were uh, kind of known, uh, were um, identified to have early sepsis. They were also not uh, enrolled. And uh, the 4,500, that, and it was monitored very tightly, uh, in the field by different level supervisors, including um, uh, including the PIs and the and the site PIs, and um, and what we found at the end of the after the study was unblinded was uh, death and sepsis. We had very few deaths, only four and uh, six, and this was because bulk of the deaths uh, did take place in the 2,500 that we enrolled. And they were high risk infants, and that's where uh, the problem, the deaths took place. And and the infants that we are talking about here were uh, captured and um, literally 
uh, watched uh, on a daily basis by the uh, by the village level workers and then they were taken brought to the hospital with uh, with any ailment and then screened by the physician pediatrician and uh, enrolled in the study and taken and given care uh, and then we saw the sepsis and the death combined uh, there was a significant reduction in the number they needed to treat was only 27 culture positive sepsis that was our real hypothesis that gram negative sepsis that is taking place by translocation from intestine is the one that we wanted to really block through our hypothesis and that was we had very few uh, only about 33 culture positive septicemia which was reduced in the uh, treatment arm uh, but what we also found which was unexpected was a lower respiratory tract infection Uh, that was not in our mind really uh, that we could reduce based on our hypothesis uh, but uh, who still calls them as psbi that stands for possible severe bacterial infection and respiratory tract infection including pneumonia are included in in this uh, group so that was also reduced and culture negative sepsis all together uh, we had uh, uh, very significant impact local infections and some abscesses were uh, uh um, also uh, there was some reduction but not really uh, significant uh, including uh, but omphalitis and uh, diarrhea uh, we we saw uh, some um, big reduction uh, there was no impact on atopic allergic diseases and in fact we didn't even have that many in the first few few months of life uh, and it was not uh, expected so we could uh, conclude that this symbiotic preparation which we knew worked in the models uh, in the in vitro and animal models uh, could reduce uh, significantly reduce the incidence of clinical sepsis as well as culture positive sepsis uh, in units uh, in a developing uh, country setting and uh, more importantly or equally importantly uh, the low respiratory tract infections and pneumonia was was also reduced so at this point we think that it is not just the bacterial translocation which we thought to be the key in giving half of the gram negative sepsis uh, in developing countries uh, there are other immunomodulatory uh, effects that that are going on um, in this in this uh, system uh, a lot of people uh, worked in this study which uh, i won't be able to name in in 10 minutes and uh, all the background uh, preliminary studies including this clinical trial all those were funded by nih and uh, nichd and we had great help from the government of india and the government of odisha where we did the study and finally thanks to all the parents who had uh, uh, trust in us and enrolled their babies uh, to uh, come at it from at this bring us to this point thank you thank you dr panagrahi um a great and comprehensive assessment of this uh, complicated and underappreciated topic. Unfortunately, uh we do not presently have time for questions. We're going to have to move on to our next speaker. So apologies to the audience to give us some great questions. Hopefully you'll be able to reach out to Dr. Panigrahi uh, independently. Um our next speaker needs very little introduction. Dr. Deborah Cook joins us from Canada. She is a professor of medicine, clinical epidemiology and biostatistics, uh, an academic chair of critical care. Uh, she is a former chair of the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group uh, with long-standing research in the prevention of ICU acquired complications and a truly impressive uh, publication history and academic production. Uh, Dr. Cook, the floor is yours. Hello everybody. Good day. Thank you for this invitation. It's an amazing event I put on again this year. Uh, my objectives today are to review a little bit about the microbiome and the way that we are increasingly modifying the microbiome with the way we live as humans all over the world, but more particularly with our preventive and therapeutic interventions outside the hospital setting and uh, within the hospital and particularly in the ICU. I'm going to draw on three outcomes to reflect some of the randomized trial data, ventilator associated pneumonia, clostridium difficile infection, and uh, briefly sepsis. The idea of the definition is just to um point out 
we use the word microbiome, but we really we are referring to the genomic material of the microbiota or the organisms that we live uh, symbiotically with. So the definition of the microbiome is really um, rephrased as microbiota, the e ecological community of commensal symbiotic and pathogenic microorganisms that live in us or on us. We are completely outnumbered by microbial cells. Our human cells are outnumbered 10 to 1, and the genetic uh, production of material uh, also, we're way, way outnumbered by um, protein coding uh, genes uh, by, by, by the bacteria. So if we think about that as uh, the background definition, and acknowledge the importance of bacteria that we live with. We know that uh, one to three percent of our body weight is contributed to by the microbiome, and there has been a huge increase in the research interest on the microbiome. Uh, notably, an NIH-funded project, the Human Microbiome Project, has helped to uh, indicate to us whether or not different disease states are related to different taxa and communities of bacteria. Depression, gastrointestinal disorders, asthma, obesity, there's a range of associations that I'm sure you have been reading about. And the number of publications uh, on uh, Medline, for example, PubMed, has increased exponentially on the microbiome. There are many modern-day influences to be aware of. I'm sure many of you um, know that the way babies are delivered, the way they are fed, our attention to hygiene uh, in some parts of the world, the food processing, the antimicrobials administered not only to humans but to animals that are eaten in many parts of the world, and the achlorhydria or acid suppression, which is so common in the community setting as well as in the hospital setting, influence the microbiome. And during critical illness, people come to the intensive care unit with many of these modulators at play. And there's been a suspicion that if we further um, modify the microbiome in the ICU, we maybe can mitigate some of the complications of critical illness. And this uh, phenomenon may be unrelated to the antimicrobials that are given to patients in the ICU. So the concept is that everybody starts with a, a microbiome. It may or may not be a healthy microbiome based on the acute and chronic illnesses we have as citizens in the community. Uh, but when people become critically ill, whether or not it's from motor vehicle accident or pancreatitis that may be non-infectious causes of critical illness, um, our um, microbiome may become so-called the unhealthy pathobiome. There has been, following the NIH initiative, the ICU Microbiome Project, which is very interesting, um, initiative to try to better characterize what we refer to as the dysbiosis that occurs when uh, patients become critically ill. And simply, and perhaps over simply said, there are some health promoting bacteria living within us, on us, in us, um, and th those that are more pathogenic, those that are potentially pathogenic. And the association between disease states out in the community and the microbiome has been rather mirrored in early publications such that mortality rates seem to be associated with different uh, microbial patterns during critical illness, both on admission and throughout the course of critical illness. And, uh, of course, the gut has been the focus of a lot of these analyses. So the idea that we modify the unhealthy pathobiome and uh, help patients recover to reacquire their uh, healthy or at least uh, base state microbiome uh, has been popularized and biotics may be uh, this mechanism. And of course, the biotics we think often about are antibiotics, but that's not what I'm going to speak about here. It's probiotics. So the definition, according to the World Health Organization, is community a commercially available microorganisms which when ingested as individual strains or in combinations of strains offer potential health benefits to the host. So you can see this is a very general definition and acknowledges the many types of microorganisms which could be ingested in combination or singularly. It doesn't speak about dose, doesn't speak about duration. 
Uh, and it is the combination of uh, probiotics and uh, fodder uh, that bacteria uh, live off, the, the so-called symbiotics that we mostly eat uh, as, as citizens. You're familiar, I'm sure, with it, kimchi and yogurt and kombucha and other types of probiotics, uh, sauerkraut, etc. So how might probiotics work. There are many theories. There are observational studies in humans. There are observational studies in a range of animal models. And the most popular ones are the colonization resistance, such that when probiotics are ingested into the proximal GI tract, <clears throat> there uh, is enhancement of tight junctions, enhancement of mucus production, uh, minimization of uh, pathogen adhesion and translocation. But there are many other more general mechanisms touted that uh, relate to enhanced um, immunomodulation, minimization of uh, inflammation, enhancement of anti-inflammatory approaches when people have infectious or non-infectious uh, conditions to bring them to the ICU. And there have been a few mechanistic studies nested within RCTs that uh, may give insights. But it is, it is pretty clear that we are not totally clear about how probiotics may confer benefit. So preventing ventilator-associated pneumonia, as you know, the main um, entry into the lung obviously is through the endotracheal tube and the biofilm present on all endotracheal tubes and tracheostomy tubes can facilitate direct entry of bacteria into the lungs uh, and there's also hematogenous spread to the lungs, but clearly our mouse as the beginning of the uh, respiratory tract and the associated ET tube, it are, it's a very important vehicle. To cut to the chase, there have been many randomized clinical trials in critically ill patients whereby patients are allocated to receive a type of probiotic versus placebo. Sometimes the intervention is, is a symbiotic, a, that is a prebiotic and a probiotic together. And the patients have been followed forward to identify pneumonia. Pneumonia, of course, defined many different ways by uh, different authors. And you can see um, on the uh, forest plot here, there is a risk ratio of about 0 0.74, suggesting a 25% or so reduction in ventilator-associated pneumonia with these randomized trials. Of note, only about 1,200 patients randomized in the whole of the world's literature. And when we consider the uh, risk of bias of these studies or the uh, quality in an earlier systematic review and meta-analysis by the Cochrane Group, the um, assessment of uh, rigorous allocation and concealment and outcome uh, assessments and un unbiased ascertainment of outcome, et cetera, uh, show that the risk of bias is definitely present in these randomized trials. Many of them are single center, not multi-center, and were done a while ago, but they are very, very tantalizing, excellent first steps that lead us to wonder whether probiotics really confer a, a health benefit. One additional study mechanistically I just wanted to highlight um, was an, uh, an open-label randomized trial in over 200 adults, and the probiotic administered was Bacillus and Enterococcus faecalis, which would not typically be uh, bacteria included in probiotic uh, profiles administered in, in practice today. But what was identified in this RCT was not only um, lower rates of uh, pneumonia, um, but a fewer potentially pathogenic microorganisms. And this is an example of a mechanistic uh, trial that uh, could lead us to understand how probiotics may work. In a Markov model that was done to analyze of all the different ways we could prevent pneumonia, where do probiotics fit? This complex Markov model led to um, bottom line that probiotics, based on the randomized trial to date and the associated economic analyses, uh, suggest that uh, probiotics may have a favorable cost-benefit ratio, but we're thinking that more data is probably are needed before we're, we're sure about this. 
Preventing Clostridium difficile is also an important outcome, and there are two key meta-analyses I'd like to share. One, enrolling children and adults in randomized trials who've received any probiotic versus placebo for the prevention of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Remarkably, 12,000 patients have been randomized with such a goal in mind. And here, the pooled relative risk was about 0.6, suggesting a very strong reduction in antibiotic-associated diarrhea, but some substantial heterogeneity exists in the results. Uh, nonetheless, the subgroups appear to hold uh, whether or not we're talking about a specific genus, species, or strain, any particular age, clinical condition, or setting. The further meta-analysis focusing on not just antibiotic-associated diarrhea, but Clostridium difficile has a similar structure Children and adults were considered in a randomized trial that allocated patients to probiotic or placebo looking for the outcome of Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea, nearly 4,000 patients. And this suggested, again, a substantial, clinically important, statistically significant reduction in Clostridium difficile, again, uh, considered to be quite robust across uh, different subgroups. There have been other uh, randomized trials, which are loud, uh, sorry, large, uh, done in nursing home patients, which have not shown uh, this benefit in totality, but this also looks quite promising. We've been speaking about oral probiotics, but wanted to uh, just acknowledge there's different vehicles for administration through fecal transplant or gastric lavage, and in um, the minimization of recurrence of Clostridium difficile uh, fecal microbiota transplantation, whether frozen or thawed in preparation, has also been evaluated. And as you know, the Clostridium difficile recurrence rate now in various parts of the world is 20 to 25 percent. And there have been uh, Im important randomized trials uh, suggesting that uh, there may be secondary prevention benefit to um, rectally administered probiotics uh, frozen seem to be uh, as effective as uh, thought, which is important in production. Another example of uh, a very small RCT examining the use of uh, bowel lavage and nasogastric infusion of donor feces. This would be another take on um, microbiome modification through probiotics that would be the bacteria found in feces, evaluating whether or not uh, Clostridium difficile may be reduced by administration in this method. And in fact, the one of the metrics of microbiome modification, microbiome health, is fecal bacterial diversity, which was enhanced after the donor feces infusion. It seemed as well to be better at curing recurrent difficile. Preventing sepsis, probably the most exciting randomized trial, was discussed uh, just recently, um, evaluating infants and the administration of lactobacillus and uh, an FOS uh, substrate starting day two to day four for infants in rural India. And the outcomes there were sepsis and death, and while very few infants in the end died, just 10 in total. There are very important benefits observed for the decreased risk of gram-negative sepsis, gram-positive sepsis, lower respiratory tract infections, and in fact, uh, outcomes which may not be infection-related, such as diarrhea. And this was published in Nature and speaks, I think, very well to the um, exciting uh, results that have begun to emerge when probiotics are rigorously tested in, in very large randomized trials. So we know the microbiome is modified in critical illness, but I think it's fair to say our understanding still is emerging. We've got a lot of high-cost, high-technology interventions that we use in the ICU. Probiotics are the opposite of that, low-tech, low-cost, and certainly widely available in the food we eat and prescribed uh, often in the hospital and nursing home setting. So whether or not modification can actually decrease the risk of various infections 
is uh, clinically uh, important and a, and a great research priority. The Canadian Critical Care Trials Group is uh, just about finished a 2,650 patient randomized trial, including adults who are expected to be ventilated for three days. We're testing lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, which is a very common and uh, appears to be efficacious um, a probiotic used in earlier literature and looking at the outcomes of a ventilator associated pneumonia, any infection, including sepsis, C. diff, diarrhea, uh, and antimicrobial stewardship as, as various outcomes. So this is just a summary slide of uh, some of the randomized trials that have been meta-analyzed and the approximate estimates of, of benefit inside and outside the ICU. Uh, while we're the jury's, you know, not totally decided on the impact of probiotics, certainly these these look to be promising yet uh, diverse in their in their effect on patients in the ICU. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Thank you. What a great overview of a, a very timely and certainly. Um, very important topic in terms of possible prevention strategies for DICU and infections. A couple of questions from our audience. Um, in your opinion, what combination of bacterial uh, probiotic therapy is the most beneficial? To which which regimens could the evidence most support? It's a great question. Probiotics have not been tested well against each other. So we don't have, for example, a randomized trial of Saccharomyces versus Lactobacillus. So what we have to draw on is indirect evidence of the apparent benefit conferred in randomized trial of one probiotic versus the other. So the, the indirect comparison means the inferences are very weak. And I think the lactobacillus is probably the um, most favorable in the RCTs that have been conducted to date. And it seems like all of them have potential harm associated with case reports. Again, a fairly low level of evidence, obviously. But the Saccharomyces seems to be uh, very, very common in patients, particularly with impaired gut integrity uh, or immune compromised. State. So I think those are um, disfavored by many um, internutrition guidelines. Excellent. Um, a next question. Um, what are your thoughts on the simultaneous use of probiotics during antibiotic therapy? Is there a role for that, uh, the kind of adjunct therapies together? Mm-hmm. Probiotics are tested in the community setting to try to prevent antibiotic-associated diarrhea, and some of the RCTs in the meta-analysis I showed um, highlight a, a exactly that uh, implementation strategy, and antibiotic-associated diarrhea does seem to be decreased. And that's an important outcome for uh, children who may not go to school if they've got bad diarrhea, could get very dehydrated, particularly uh, malnourished persons, uh, nursing home patients. When there's diarrhea, there's a huge outbreak sometimes, and nursing homes are shut down um, until infectious causes are, are ruled out. So antibiotic-associated diarrhea and mitigation thereof it's potentially very important from a public health point of view. And I know lots of family docs uh, give probiotics whenever they prescribe an antibiotic. We don't do that in the ICU, uh, generally speaking, according to many of our formal and informal surveys, because obviously we'd be giving a lot of probiotics uh, out. We're hoping to answer that question with a prospect trial to understand the influence of diarrhea, because many, many other things cause diarrhea in the ICU, as we know. Of course. Well, last quick question, that was certainly not an easy one. Uh, your thoughts on the use of probiotics in, in the immunosuppressed patient population? Tricky question. Many cancer patients take yogurt at home to eat. Many cancer centers, oncologic critical care centers, um, avoid the use of probiotics uh, for hospitalized patients. It's unclear, but profound immunosuppression which could occur by convention during critical illness, um, it's thought to be a worry. Most of the trials these days exclude people with severe neutropenia, HIV, et cetera, more sort of classical immunosuppression profiles. 
Um, but again, safety data are, are needed in the form of randomized trials for sure. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Wick, thank you so much for a great talk and some great answers to some very complicated questions. <laughs> Greatly appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Take care. Moving onward, our next speaker, who unfortunately will not be able to join us live, so I apologize to the audience. We will not be able to take any questions. However, our next speaker in, in the critical care arena needs very little introduction, uh, Dr. Greet Vanderberg. Uh, is a very well-established figure in international critical care. She is presently the head of intensive care medicine at the University of Leuven in Belgium, um, a full professor of medicine. She has uh, contributed greatly to the field of critical care, particularly in the subfield of endocrinology of critical illness. Uh, she has wide sending uh, recognition and support for research in this field from both the Belgium and the EU and uh, honors from both the German National Academy of Sciences and the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. Uh, again, unfortunately, we will not be able to take any questions as Dr. Evander cannot join us live, but uh, we look forward to hearing her talk now. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to speak about nutrition in the ICU is less more. This is my conflicts of interest slide. Um, the work that I present here today uh, is only funded through formal official uh, government research grants from the European Research Council and from the Belgian government. Undernutrition is associated with adverse outcome of critical illness. This is known for quite a long time and this applies to adult ICU patients as well as pediatric ICU patients. But of course, association is by no means proof of causality, you know, the chicken or egg question. And given that most studies showing that association between undernutrition and adverse outcomes were on enteronutrition, the risk of bias is very large. Indeed, the sickest patients are the ones that don't tolerate enteronutrition. And hence, the association of undernutrition with adverse outcome could be explained by the illness severity on one hand, or it could be caused by the undernutrition. The only way to know the causality in that association is by performing randomized control trials. We have performed two very large multi-center RCTs on this topic. The first one in adults, the ePANIC trial, published in 2011, 4,600 patients included. And the second one in pediatric ICU, the PPANIC trial, published in 2016. The design of the trials, both of them, was identical. So the state of the art was to use early parental nutrition to supplement any insufficient enteral nutrition from very early on during the first week and up until full enteral nutrition was achieved. That was the state of the art. The intervention uh, was to omit that early parental nutrition throughout the first week in ICU. Both groups had early enteral nutrition attempted, but unlike what the cartoon suggests, this was often not successful, not even on day seven in the ICU. Particularly surgical patients don't tolerate enteral nutrition well. There were patients who, hadn't, who didn't have a functional GI tract available. They were all in the trial. Um, and so that could mean that patients who were in the late PN arm received no nutrition at all up until the morning of day eight in ICU. So this was a comparison of early full feeding with accepting early macronutrient deficit. It's very important to note that both groups received early micronutrients. And this is important to also do if one would implement the strategy in clinical practice. Give the micronutrients, even if you don't give the parental nutrition. Now, the results were striking. Not giving parental nutrition accelerated recovery in adults as well as in children. What uh, the figures show here is the likelihood of, uh, uh, of being discharged from ICU or the likelihood of being discharged alive from ICU to penalize for death as a competing risk. And the, all the graphs show the same thing. The patients who were randomized to the late PN group did better. The effect size was larger in the pediatric ICU. The effect size was larger in patients without a functional GI tract. 
the effect size was larger in the sicker patients. Second outcome was that not giving parental nutrition um, in the ICU resulted in fewer infections, again, both in adults and in children. And again, the effect size was larger in the children. And again, it applies to patients with sepsis or septic shock. Uh, they were all in the trial. It was a very important subgroup, and they responded similarly. Then we did some further analyses um, to identify whether there were subgroups who might have been uh, benefiting, for example, from the parental nutrition. And I don't have time to show you all the data, but what we found was that the more patients were at risk, the more severely ill they were, the more susceptible they were to harm by early parental nutrition. And again, both in adults and in children. And then the question, of course, came, well, this is all fine, the acute effects are there, but what about long-term outcomes, particularly in children? Does this have any deleterious effect on their development, on their growth, on their neurocognitive um, development over time? That is why we performed um, a long-term follow-up study in the critically ill children two years after they were included in the study uh, with an assessment of growth, uh, medical problems, and with a, a very thorough assessment of their um, neurocognitive development. It was very important to note that there was no harm whatsoever from late PN. There was no difference between late PN and early PN patients for growth, for their um, medical uh, condition, for parts of their neurocognitive development, but there was a benefit. Patients who were uh, had been included in the trial on late PN had a better development of inhibitory control, working memory, metacognition, they had less externalizing problems and a better visual motor integration. So not only do um, are there the short-term benefits from late PN, also in the long term, the children do better. These are unpublished data at this moment. Then the question came, what macronutrient explains this harm? And the experts thought or suggested it would have been the glucose. But when we did a statistical analysis first in the adult study, um, as shown on this figure with benefit above the line and harm below the line, we found no harm at all explained by the glucose doses, but the harm of early PN appeared to be explained by the dose of protein early on during that first week in the ICU. However, in the adult study, there was collinearity among amino acids and lipids because we used an all-in-one product. And therefore, this study didn't allow to uh, assess the separate impact of lipids versus protein. But we could do that in the children's study. Indeed, in the children's study, the different macronutrients were titrated separately. And we found that also in the children, it was the amino acids that were the culprits, not the glucose. This figure shows you the likelihood of acquiring a new infection in the pediatric ICU. On the x-axis, you see days in ICU throughout the first week and the number of patients who were still there on that time point. And the, um, the symbols show you hazard ratios per dose of the three macronutrients. In this case, the risk of acquiring a new infection later on. And again, it's very clear that it is the protein that explained the harm, um, not the glucose nor the lipids. Similar findings for weaning from mechanical ventilation that was delayed by early parental nutrition. And again, it was a protein dose that explained that harm, not the glucose or the lipids. And similar findings for the likelihood of being discharged, discharged alive from the pediatric intensive care unit, the dose of protein explained the harm. Then, of course, the question came, well, the protein may be harmful in this context, but maybe you didn't give enough protein. There are experts who claim that you need a lot more protein to get the benefit. So what we did then was perform a dose response analysis. As you can see illustrated here, this is the analysis. The plateau, the plateau is at about 40 to 50 percent of the recommended doses. So studies that came later and that compared like moderate doses of protein with high doses of protein didn't see a difference in outcome, but in that range, the harm was already there. And for your information, if we translate that 40 to 50% of recommended doses back to a dose per kilogram body weight for the children, you see that indeed these are low doses. The next question then, of course, is, is this because of the parental route? 
answer was provided by the calories trial. Uh, this is a trial that compared the role of the route of feeding in ICU patients. The same amount of feeding was given either via the parenteral or the enteral route, and the calories trials trial did not see any differences in outcome. A more recent study uh, assessed the role of the route of feeding in patients with shock and found similar outcomes. No difference in mortality, but the enteral group had a higher risk of serious gastrointestinal complications. Are our data different from other RCTs? Are they conflicting? Um, I'm going to compare the ePANIC trial with four other trials, and I've ranked them here um, because of the doses that were compared. The EDEN and the early PN trials compared two relatively lower doses. The SPN and the TICACOS trial compared two relatively higher doses. The ePANIC compared the highest dose with the lowest dose, and that's why it's in the middle. None of these trials showed any benefit from early forceful feeding. It was only the EPANIC trial that showed the harm because, first of all, it was the largest trial, and second, because it compared the highest dose with the lowest dose. Thus, early forceful feeding up to calculated targets is not beneficial. If anything, it increases infections and slows down recovery. It is not about the route, it is all about the dose, particularly the dose of amino acids. Why would that be the case? Given that early PN slows down recovery, what do we know about recovery from critical illness? Well, critical illness is about cell damage, and cell damage needs to be removed for recovery. If those cells are skin, they can be, can be removed and replaced, but if the cells that are damaged are cells with a slow or no turnover, like neurons or myofibers, then the cell needs to remove the damage from within the cell. And here, autophagy plays a key role, um, particularly for large organelles and protein aggregates. These, when they're damaged, can only be removed by autophagy, which is a highly evolutionary conserved pathway that um, starts by, by uh, isolating the damaged organelles and protein aggregates by fusing with lysosomes to get the digestive enzymes in. Then the digestion of the, of the, the damaged organelles takes place and the uh, substrates are recycled. A very important quality control and housekeeping system um, that is important predominantly for cells with a slow turnover. This system also plays a key role for digesting uh, or, or eliminating bacteria from within um, the macrophages. We had shown in our animal work that indeed early provision of macronutrients, most specifically so amino acid, causes an autophagy deficient phenotype in the myofibers, cell damage that really resembles um, the models on autophagy deficiency. And indeed early macronutrients um, suppressed autophagy, the auto autophagy substrates then accumulate like P62, and this resulted in uh, more ubiquitin staining suggesting the protein aggregates in the cells. Also in the um, human studies that we've performed, we have biopsies from, the, from that RCT, that first adult RCT, we found that early macronutrients suppress autophagy, and, and also in the myofibers, ubiquitin staining was increased by early parental feeding. This was functionally relevant because early parental nutrition uh, induced more weakness and slowed down the recovery of the weakness, and this was explained by the autophagy suppression, as indicated in the previous slide. Just briefly, there is also another uh, pathway that plays a role. If you give amino acids during critical illness, this increases uh, glucagon profoundly. An increased glucagon activates a sort of futile cycling in the liver, uh, burning the excess of the amino acids. This explains why in the adult study, we had shown that urea increases and also nitrogen wasting in the urine increases. And a similar finding was done for the pediatric study where urea increased in the early PN group from as soon as the amino acids were kicked in. So is less more in feeding the critically ill? I think it is indeed the case. So what do we do in clinical practice? During the first week in ICU, we only give that dose of enteral nutrition administered via the normal gastric route, no forceful feeding uh, uh, through jejunal tubes or anything like that. So it's the gastric uh, dose that is tolerated by the patient, no pushing, 
but very importantly, we do give micronutrients from our mission onward. It makes sense that in evolution, mechanisms linked fasting to healing. Indeed, our um, prehistoric ancestors had to rely on, on long uh, episodes of macronutrient scarcity. And when they were sick or had a minor trauma, of course, this risk of undernutrition increased. And that is why probably throughout evolution, these two phenomena have been linked. And since we now know that Autophagy is such an important housekeeping quality control system that can recycle substrates in fasting conditions. This explains why it could be important in our ICU patients from throughout evolution being well conserved up until today in the ICU. What do we do after the first week? Well, actually, we will now provide parental nutrition if enteral feeding is in, insufficient. However, there is no real evidence to support that either, so future research should really focus on that question. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Well, Dr. Vanderberg, wherever you are, uh, thank you for a truly excellent talk, extremely thought-provoking, and certainly not only with robust science, but also some distinct clinical management implications for those of us that practice uh, critical care on a regular basis. Unfortunately, as mentioned before, uh, Dr. Vandenberg was not able to join us live, so there will be no questions. I apologize to the audience. Before we move on to our next speaker, let me just remind everyone that World Sepsis Day is coming. A week from today, September the 13th, please follow the World Sepsis Day events on all of your favorite social media platforms. We are live on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Please check us out. A also quick reminder, the lectures you have been hearing on this session and for all the sessions from the World Sepsis Congress will be available recorded and available for viewing on both YouTube and Apple Podcasts. So whenever you feel like checking any of these events out, you are more than welcome to do so at your leisure. I believe we are ready for our penultimate speaker. This is very exciting. Dr. Petra Gastmeier joins us from Berlin, where she is the director of the Institute of Hygiene and Environmental Medicine, and a very active researcher and speaker on hospital-acquired infections and their prevention. It should be a very important talk for those of us that practice clinical medicine in a hospital setting. So without further ado, I believe Dr. Gassmeyer is ready. Excellent. Yeah. Let us begin. Yeah. Hello. Nice to, nice to hear you. Um, I would like to talk about how to prevent hospital-acquired infections. Two years ago, um, Cassini et al. published their paper about the burden of hospital-acquired infections in Europe. They concentrated on the six most relevant hospital-acquired infections and used the data of the European Prevalence Study in 2011-2012 to estimate the overall annual number of hospital-acquired infections. Here you can find the number of cases for the six most relevant hospital acquired infections. Altogether, about 2.6 million cases can be expected every year. To illustrate this, 2.6 million patients means more as a number of inhabitants in Paris. The most frequent with a similar number are pneumonia, urinary tract infections, and surgical site infections, followed by primary bloodstream infections and Clostridium difficile infections. There is also a large number of secondary bloodstream infections, but they are regarded as a consequence of the presented primary infections and therefore not a focus of prevention measures. According to the ECDC definition, the definitions of the European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, an infection is regarded as hospital acquired if the onset of symptoms was on day three or later of the current hospital stay. The day of admission 
is counted as the first day for this definition. The measures to prevent hospital acquired infections can be distinguished according to the development of hospital acquired infections. Most are of endogenous origin, but there is also a substantial proportion with an exogenous origin. Exogenous infections occur because of transmission of pathogens via healthcare workers, other patients, or the environment. Of course, not every transmission event is followed by a hospital-acquired infection. But depending on the type and amount of pathogens and the immune system of the receiving patients, this may lead to a hospital-acquired infection. Many years ago, we did a prospective cohort study during 18 months in five ICUs in Berlin to answer the question how many infections are caused by patient-to-patient -patient transmission. ICU-acquired infections were ascertained during daily bedside patient and chart review, and episodes of potential cross-transmission were identified by pulse g electrophoresis and PCR methods. In summary, a total of 431 ICU-acquired infections and 141 episodes of transmission were identified, and a total of 278 infections were caused by the 10 species that were genotyped, and 41 of these, that means 14.5%, could be associated with transmission between patients. Meanwhile, the typing methods are much better and whole genome sequencing is the standard method. In a similar study published last year, Price et al. performed a systematic sampling of healthcare workers, the environment and patients over 14 months at one ICU in England. Whole genome sequencing was performed for all Staph aureus isolates. Here you can see the results. Isolates from 198 healthcare workers, 40 environmental locations, and 1,854 patients were taken. A total of 1,819 isolates were sequenced. At the end, only 25 instances of transmission to patients were detected. That means, meanwhile, the percentage of exogenous hospital-acquired infections may be even lower in many institutions. The most important measures to prevent transmission events is a high compliance to hand hygiene. How I often, however, often compliance is not good enough. Hand hygiene compliance observations data from about 300 German hospitals demonstrate that the median compliance rate after 10 years of our national hand hygiene campaign is 77 in ICUs and 75% in non-ICU wards. That means hand hygiene compliance is still not sufficient in the majority of hospitals. Other important measures to prevent transmission are the quality of reprocessing medical devices and the quality of cleaning and disinfection. The majority of hospital acquired infections are of endogenous origin and you all know that the human microbiome consists of a very large amount of microorganisms, most of them in the gut, but also on the skin and the mucous fibrates. They get access to the right parts of the body. If they get access to the right parts of the body, hospital acquired infections may occur. This can be the case during manipulations of devices such as vascular catheters, urinary catheters, or intubation, or during operations. For instance, skin contamination may lead to extraluminal excess of the blood vessels. Another example is the endogenous infection of the lower respiratory tract by bacteria from the oral and gastrointestinal flora by overcoming the barrier of the cuff of the tube in intubated patients. 
of the urinary catheter leads to contamination of the bladder. And during abdominal surgery, it may come to contamination of the surroundings of the intestine. Meanwhile, we know that it's possible to decrease the endogenous infections by multimodal prevention measures. They are often also called a bundle approach. The effectiveness of a bundle approach depends on the baseline situation in the own institution, the individual bundle components, and the compliance with bundle components. Meanwhile, a large number of systematic reviews is available demonstrating that it is possible to decrease hospital-acquired infections substantially by a bundle approach. In general, 40 to 60 percent of device-associated infections can be reduced by this approach. In addition, dysbiosis is a crucial factor, in particular in the group of intensive care patients and patients with wound marrow transplantation. Mucosal barrier injuries and translocation may also lead to the development of hospital-acquired infections. Measures against dysbiosis, mainly in the group of ICU patients and patients with BMT, are antibiotic stewardship, fecal transplantation, and the use of probiotics. Meanwhile, we have also an overview about a large number of systematic reviews investigating the use of probiotics to prevent hospital-acquired infections. A reduction of 25 to 70% can be achieved for prevention of hospital-acquired pneumonia, urinary tract infections, surgical site infections following abdominal surgery, and hospital-acquired clostridium difficile infections. The key factor is the implementation of evidence-based infection control measures. To achieve a good implementation, we need enough healthcare workers on the ward. We need qualified infection control staff. They are in charge for surveillance and feedback of infection rates to stimulate further activities and have to perform audits, education, and training. A further very relevant factor is the leadership of the hospital director. He should set targets stimulate activities, and evaluate the effects. One year ago, WHO colleagues published a core components, published core components for effective infection pre prevention and control programs. They formulated 11 recommendations and three good practice statements, including a summary of the supporting evidence. Meanwhile, they also created an assessment tool for the national and the hospital level to determine the situation of the own institution and on a national level with regard to core components. This seems to be very useful, seems to be a very useful tool to improve infection control and prevention. Let me summarize. Depending on the baseline situation and the type of infection, a high proportion of hospital acquired infections can be prevented between 20 and 50 percent. And there are four key measures stop transmission, optimize use of devices, prevent surgical site infections, prevent dysbiosis in high risk areas like ICUs or neonatal ICUs. And I would like to emphasize also that leadership is also very crucial. Thank you for attention. Dr. Gassmer, thank you. What a great presentation of a very important topic within the prevention circles, particularly in, in the inpatient and ICU world. A couple of questions. Uh, I mean, simple, a simple question, and I have a simple answer for our audience. What is the single one thing that we can do most effectively to prevent hospital acquired infections? Well, yeah, I'm convinced that the single most important measure is uh, to perform good hand hygiene. Absolutely. Uh, and um, what do you think that the biggest barriers to the the implementation of good hand hygiene is? I mean, it, it's such a such a simple thing, right? But yeah. uh, you know, why are even in you know 
good healthcare systems like you have in Germany were his adherents. So um, underwhelming. Yeah, despite we did a lot of education, it's still the case that many healthcare workers do not really know what is an indication for hand hygiene. And another main barrier is that they feel uh, that they have not enough time for hand hygiene. But in reality, hmm. this is not the case. We, we did a study and we have seen uh, that even under very good conditions, no uh, understaffing and no overcrowding, uh, the healthcare workers had a relatively low compliance to hand hygiene. <laughs> so it's the most important point is to establish um, a culture where everybody is is very good in hand hygiene and ha can achieve a very good compliance to hand hygiene. Excellent. It's so important. Uh, my my other question, and I, I I really like when you brought this up. Uh, when you talk about bundles of care, what do you think the difference is between um, these rigid rigid bundles that kind of come down from above, you know, the Ministry of Health or from uh, you know, different large-scale organizations versus institution-specific bundles? What do you think the, the advantages or disadvantages of each of those approaches is? Um. I like uh, institution-associated uh, bundles because I think uh, that each in institution has different problems. And I believe it's not so appropriate to use uh, the same bundle in every institution. Uh, perhaps you have a very good compliance to one or two elements of the bundle in your institution, then it makes much more sense to put your emphasis on the other elements uh, of this bundle or to add another element, but uh, it's necessary to have a good overview about the situation in your in your hospital. That means you have to perform compliance observations to uh, to see what happens in my ICU. And it's also very important to observe the procedures uh, in order to identify um, good further elements for bandits. Excellent. So just ob observing the processes within your own hospital and directing your efforts towards the deficiencies is the optimal way forward. I think so, yes. Excellent. Well, Dr. Gasparri, thank you so much for your time this morning and for a, a great and extremely timely talk. We will be moving on now thank you. to the final speaker of session 11, Dr. Benedetta Allegrandi, apologies for any mispronunciations. Uh, Dr. Allegrandi joins us from the World Health Organization, where she's a specialist in infectious diseases, tropical medicine, infection prevention, and control, and in fact, uh, serves as the coordinator of the Infection Prevention Control Global Unit of the WHO, including the Clean Care and Safer Care Program. Uh, a very busy woman, presently involved in uh, activities controlling uh, Ebola, among other uh, pressing responsibilities. So, uh, without further ado, Dr. Alagranzi, welcome. Hello, thank you very much for your introduction and uh, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone online. Uh, so thank you for uh, to the organizers for inviting me and uh, I'm also very pleased to follow on uh, from Professor Gassmeyer because uh, she really put the foundations for this important topic of healthcare associated infections, uh, which, as you all know, are often um, cause of sepsis and sepsis shock. And uh, I will now uh, actually focus more on this problem in low resource uh, settings uh, in low middle income countries, uh, which is a domain uh, I've been honored to work in uh, over the last 10 years, uh, especially in my WHO work. 
Uh, so first of all, to remind everyone uh, that prevention uh, is one of the key focuses of the um, resolution on sepsis, which was passed by the World Health Assembly last year. So this is a very important topic for us all, um, among those others uh, which are on this uh, uh, slide, epidemiology and burden, diagnosis and clinical management, uh, including the problem of antimicrobial resistance. So as I said, I will uh, focus now on uh, the problem of HAIs in low middle income countries and uh, to show this map uh, that comes from uh, um, a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, that we conducted in 2010, published in The Lancet and also in a WHO report, uh, which documented that this problem is much more remarkable in low-middle-income countries with uh, an average prevalence of 10%, uh, but uh, in high-quality papers increasing to 15%, as compared to uh, our meta-analysis in high-income countries where the prevalence in particular in Europe was on average uh, 8%. So this is at least a double um, as uh, compared to uh, high-income countries. In the next slide, we can see in the same study, uh, we conducted uh, sub-analysis uh, related to critically ill patients. Uh, so comparing again data uh, on incidence density uh, in uh, high-income countries and low-middle-income countries. Um, I have no time to detail all the data, but from this slide, you can see that the comparison leads to an incidence in high-risk patients, which is uh, from two to three times higher on average. But for some types of infections, uh, it was uh, up to 13 times higher. So we are talking about uh, overall HAIs in uh, uh, critically ill patients or device-associated infections in uh, uh, the same type of patients. Um, if we look at uh, the next slide, uh, again, uh, talking about uh, middle-income countries or low-income countries, recent studies, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, point uh, prevalence study uh, performed in Brazil by uh, Professor Machado and colleagues uh, uh, identified uh, HAIs as a risk factor, independent risk factor for mortality in ICU septic patients. Or uh, another study which, is, which was published uh, this year, early this year, uh, demonstrating that infection is the most frequent complication of surgery in Africa. This was a very large study covering 25 African countries. Um, and finally, uh, in terms of this burden, uh, we can see um, a prevalence uh, study that WHO conducted in 2014 um, related to antimicrobial resistance um, from inpatient clinical blood and urine specimens, where we demonstrated uh, with uh, uh, sophisticated analysis that um, the prevalence of some uh, resistant microorganisms that are very important, such as uh, MRSA or carbapenem resistant uh, uh, Enterobacteriaceae and others have a significantly higher prevalence in blood cultures in low middle income countries, for instance. So uh, my colleague Petra has already talked about what are the solutions. Uh, she focused on uh, specific measures and gave a very good overview of this. And now I will try to uh, focus on, on other aspects and especially discuss the challenges uh, in low middle income countries or low resource settings. Uh, so WHO developed a number of uh, guidelines which are based on um, uh, rigorous assessment of the evidence and also uh, expert and uh, implementers and users uh, consensus. Uh, the, on this slide, you can see a number of guidelines that we issued over the last few years on uh, specific problems. Uh, the most important guideline I want to focus on is this one, which is uh, related to uh, what are the core components for effective IPC programs. These guidelines are based on evidence. Uh, several systematic reviews are the base of this and have been published in the literature. 
there are eight core components, according to the evidence and to the experts, uh, which go from uh, an IPC program, both at the national and the facility level, the availability of guidelines and SOPs for the prevention of HAIs, education and training, HAI surveillance, and monitoring, auditing, and feedback of IPC practices. All of this must be sustained and supported by an enabling environment, which means availability of infrastructures, supplies, and equipment, and also availability of adequate uh, human resources um, and infrastructure, once again, and factors with appropriate, such as appropriate bed occupancy. Um, these guidelines uh, also include aspects related to the facility level, uh, and here in this uh, slide, which uh, features a, a section of an infographic that issued on prevention of sepsis this year, uh, tells you that um, IPC programs, and in particular hand hygiene uh, approaches, are effective in reducing HAIs at the facility level. And especially for low resource settings, there are some essential uh, measures and practices such as hand hygiene, a clean, well-functioning environment and equipment, safe water and sanitation, a solid IPC program, and SOPs and specific measures, especially for invasive procedures such as uh, use of uh, catheters or, or uh, mechanical ventilation and surgery. These are the basics, uh, which are very important for low-middle-income countries in particular. Uh, we also published uh, a paper in the Lancet Global Health, which highlights, according to many experts and international organizations involved in IPC, uh, what are the priorities for IPC uh, in the next five years, uh, in particular for countries which have just started their journey in establishing or improving IPC programs. And uh, you can read the paper. I don't want to mention what are these priorities because these are also reflected in the next part of my presentation. So now, uh, according to our experience over many years, and also uh, the lessons learned from many colleagues uh, we are in dialogue with, what are the challenges to implement IPC in low-middle-income countries? First of all, uh, the problem is that HAIs and IPC are not on the top of the national health agenda. And indeed, uh, many countries ha may have a policy or a plan, but there is a gap between having policies and plans and actual implementation. Another problem is that there are lack of reliable data on HAIs due to poor laboratory support and surveillance systems, and therefore, not knowing the problem, you cannot also be proactive in uh, putting in place solutions. Other issues are lack of expertise, lack of qualified and trained IPC professionals, in general, limited human resources and understaffing, and inadequate budgets at the national and facility level dedicated to infection prevention and control. There are also issues in uh, uh, gaps for wash and infrastructures, um, supplies procu procurement uh, are also a problem. Um, and finally, everywhere in the world, but in particular for low-middle-income countries, there is a need for adaptation and tailoring to the cultural uh, setting and local context uh, and according to available resources of any SOPs or guidelines that we develop. And this is a challenge in itself, um, of course. So to support what I've just said, you can see uh, WHO conducted a survey uh, on AMR, uh, national action plans, uh, looking at infection prevention and control programs as well. And you can see that in uh, uh, over, uh, over the world, uh, only 58% of countries report to have a national IPC program and an operational plan and national IPC guidelines. Uh, and even worse is the fact that only 13% report to um, 
undertake uh, compliance uh, with these guidelines assessments and assessment of the effectiveness and impact of these programs. Another element is uh, several studies, including a WHO report, which uh, highlight that uh, there is clear there are clear gaps in availability of water and sanitation at the facility level worldwide. And you can see here that, for instance, availability of water in healthcare facilities was 38% uh, uh, lacking water uh, or 50% in a more recent uh, systematic review. And WHO also conducted studies on the level of hand hygiene programs uh, worldwide, and you can see the red bars are uh, related to Africa, where the average of progress of IPC programs is significantly lower compared to the average in general and also to other uh, regions in the world. So we have to say, uh, however, that um, when we talk about implications for low-middle-income countries, uh, we need to emphasize once again that the resources invested are worth the net gain, irrespective of the context and despite of costs incurred, because infection prevention and control is cost-effective. Cost effective. Not all solutions require additional resources, and uh, some solutions are low cost. Um, and also, we need to um, collaborate very closely with partners uh, assisting in the achievement of the core components, uh, delivery and funding. There is a paper by a colleague, Nizam Damani, working with us and others in developing countries, really demonstrating that there are IPC measures that are low cost or no cost. One low, no cost is, is really removal of invasive devices as soon as possible. Low cost is hand hygiene, as just uh, demonstrated, but there are many other examples that can be read in this paper. So now, uh, just a, a for a few seconds to talk about implementation. So implementation is key uh, and developing resources and approaches to implementation uh, is very important. This is why we have developed manuals for the facility and the national level and a stepwise approach for the implementation of uh, the WHO core components for effective IPC programs. And this relies always on the use of some assessment tools um, and the prioritization of the most important core components at the local level. There are many resources that are available from WHO for the implementation of the core components and other guidelines. Uh, there is a training package that WHO is issuing, uh, which is uh, uh, free of charge uh, on the website available and also available in e-learning and accompanied by several uh, resources for supporting training, especially in low resource settings. Uh, in these manuals, as I mentioned before, there are practical examples and also uh, barriers and solutions that can be encountered and found and indication for tools and resources, uh, additional tools and resources that can be used. Um, a good example of ad adaptation and adoption of the core components has been done very recently by uh, MSF. Uh, which took the core components and tried to, to understand how to implement them at the local level in their facilities worldwide and developed a policy framework uh, as well as some uh, assessment tools which uh, help hospitals uh, to adopt uh, multimodal strategies proposed by WHO and score themselves according to a five-star approach uh, and therefore be in a continuous improvement approach. And finally, uh, one example provided by WHO in four African hospitals is the implementation of a multimodal strategy to reduce surgical site infections. Uh, this is a paper we recently published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, uh, where, we, where the authors demonstrated that uh, this approach can really have a significant impact on all preventive measures that in this case were adopted uh, by local teams. And there is uh, a 60% reduction of SSI risk uh, in a multi, um, 
varied analysis uh, measuring the effect of this intervention. The success factors for this project were the use of multimodal strategy, the um, creation and empowerment of multidisciplinary teams, uh, uh, which really led the implementation of these interventions, adapting locally uh, this, this intervention, the engagement of the leadership uh, of these hospitals, and using a stepwise action plan. And finally, continuing to use data throughout the implementation of this project to learn about their, the impact of the intervention and continue in, to improve over time within a safety culture spirit. With this, I conclude and I thank you all for listening to my presentation. Dr. Algarzi, thank you so much. What a great concluding talk for our session this morning. Or morning, afternoon, evening, wherever, wherever in the world you happen to be. Uh, a question that I promised I would ask from one of our colleagues in Nigeria, where he or, he or she, apologies, uh, points out that there's often a huge gap between guidelines and protocols and what's being put forward by the ministries and clinical practice. And if you had any thoughts on how to bridge this gap between what's policy and what's actual on the ground practice. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. I think that this is a major challenge, as I mentioned. So we are very aware that implementation of these policies that are issued either by WHO or by ministries is the most important challenge. And this is why we uh, offer implementation resources to bridge this gap. Um, I think that the key solution which I propose or we propose is really the local um, engagement and adoption. It means that uh, really policies uh, and also the implementation resources that are made available must be digested, looked at locally. And local teams must be established uh, with the adequate expertise, meaning if there is someone who has some knowledge on infection prevention and control, this person needs to work with clinical teams. So if we are talking about, about for instance, preventing surgical site infections, these programs for improvement should be really led by the surgical staff supported and helped by the IPC professionals for them to really help others understand why specific measures are needed and how to improve. So this is my answer to this question in a short time. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, a, a great question that just came in. Uh, is Off the top of your head, is, do you have a, an example of um, a model where the combination of the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach is, is working well together. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, the the hand hygiene example, as well as uh, this example, I concluded with, and I really would like to emphasize that the paper published uh, has an appendix, which explains uh, really very well how. Uh, the local teams implemented this intervention uh, with many details. So I want to say that uh, there are examples on hand hygiene and in this case on surgical site infection prevention where really the top-down uh, approach has been uh, to have standards and recommendations uh, from high level uh, based on evidence, based on policies, uh, to improve these measures and, and, and these practices. And the bottom-up is really the adoption, is really the um, local adaptation that needs to be done uh, by local users. And so these two examples are well documented now in the literature. There are good examples that are available also on in low resource settings, and I really uh, encourage the audience to, to look into the literature and also look at our website because we have 
quite a lot of uh, resources, also summaries uh, of systematic reviews and also scientific publications which explain examples in particular for low middle income countries. Excellent. There, there were a couple of questions about uh, resources and additional training and um, implementation advice and guidelines. And in your opinion, your the, the WHO website that you have posted on your last slide there, is that a, a good starting point for the members of our audience that would be interested in more resources? I really think so. Uh, there is a particular area of our main web page, which is called uh, Tools and Resources, where um, we have all the implementation tools and resources available by topic, uh, at least the topics we have been able to tackle so far. And so uh, I think that this website is quite um, a user-friendly uh, resource. We refreshed it uh, a couple of years ago, and we are told uh, so far this is quite useful and, and easy to navigate. So I would really um, invite everyone to visit it and uh, also be aware that our approach is global, is for any country, but then we also work a lot to gather examples and conduct research in low resource settings because we are very much aware of the gap that is uh, coming, emerging from the literature, unfortunately still. Although there is a lot that is coming up, uh, it's very exciting to see that studies are being now more uh, conducted more in low middle income countries. So. There are good examples, not only from WHO. As I said, MSF is doing a great job in uh, trying to uh, really adapt to the reality um, in very poor countries. Well, uh, Granzi, thank you so much. What a, what a great finishing session. Sorry, finishing talk to our session today. We greatly appreciate your time and, and uh, experience and wisdom shared with, with our audience from around the world. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, for, for the rest of our audience, uh, sadly for me, this concludes our session today. I hope that you found the, the speakers as enlightening and educational and direct as I have. Um, it's been a pleasure chairing this session again. And before I sign off, I just wanted to remind all of you once again that World Sepsis Day is next week on the 13th. The activities are, will be promoted on our various social media platforms, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I'll have World Sepsis Day's uh, information and activities. Please follow us there. So I will conclude there with a thanks to all of our worldwide sponsors that helped bring you the second World Sepsis Congress. And I hope you find the rest of the Congress enlightening, informative, and enjoyable. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure hosting.